Welcome to the Milwaukee PBS special event, An Evening with Antiques and Valuables, Discussion, Valuation, and Next Steps. I'm Andrea Rivera de Vega. Today we have a panel of experts that will share some insightful information regarding value and downsizing market. We will also explore options for those looking to downsize their collections or preserve them for future generations. And we will have a brief discussion on history and the current market on a few pre-selected items submitted earlier this month. Our guest presenters today are Sherry Reilly, Kathy Schultz, and Michael Borschinger. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Hi, Andrea. And thank you for being here today. And I would like our presenters, presenters to share briefly with our audience about who they are and what they do. Let's start with you, Sherry. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks, you, Andrea. Um, I have been involved in antiques for more than 30 years. And I just wanted to briefly share how my, uh, my adventure started. Um, I was recently married and my husband and I had been living in a one bedroom apartment and we ended up purchasing our first home in Bayview. And I guess we never really thought how we were going to furnish a three bedroom house, um, you know, on a shoestring budget. So I got introduced to estate sales and rummage sales and, oh, the tough one, I got introduced to auctions. And within a short period of time, we now had a full house almost to the point where it was filled to capacity. Um, and now I kind of had to start getting rid of some of the items in my house. Um, so over those 30 years, I became very knowledgeable about antiques. Um, and then I also took some spaces in antique malls. I started selling online. I started going to flea markets. Um, so I did lots of different things um, to get rid of my now newly, required, newly acquired purchases. Um, prior to um, my taking off on this venture with antiques, I do have a degree in occupational therapy. Um, so I was nicely able to combine my uh, people skills with also um, helping people downsize their collections. Uh, about 10 years ago, I actually took the big step of getting certified as an appraiser. Um, so now I can buy and sell antiques and also help people make decisions on determining values and also downsizing their antiques. Oh, fantastic. How about you, uh, Kathy? Uh, I opened up a company called Caring Transitions just a little over eight years ago. Uh, we provide services to seniors and others for relocations, downsizing, online estate sales, in-person estate sales. And before I opened up this business, I spent 30 years in healthcare information technology. And um, at the time when I was beginning to decide whether or not I wanted to choose a different path in life, I realized a lot of my friends were struggling with downsizing their parents or even their, their own personal possessions. And um, I got very interested in helping people through that process. And so I opened up the business and we've been having a wonderful um, opportunity here to help people with their downsizing projects liquidating the items that don't fit with their new lifestyle anymore. And I've had the great opportunity to work with Sherry and Mike in the past as alternatives um, for our clients. It's our uh, responsibility to find the best solutions for them. So that's why I'm here now. Great. Uh, thank you, Kathy. How about you, Mike? Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Borschinger, and I'm the owner of the Sell It Now store. I'm also a local educator, and my background is also kind of varied, I guess. Um, I got started in the antiques and collectibles as a very young seven or eight-year-old that would go to garage sales where I grew up and bring items back to the house, and the neighbor would have a garage sale every year, and I would sell the most items out of anybody. Uh, <laughs> as a very young child. And it just kind of always was a, I guess, a constant in my life. Um, I'm also a local educator and uh, worked in information technology for almost 20 years. And uh, the uh, Sell It Now store is a Wisconsin licensed auction company. I'm also a Wisconsin licensed auctioneer. And we saw everything from 
antique jukeboxes to classic cars, trucks, motorcycles, high-end audio, vintage guitars and amps, uh, antique jukeboxes, as I said before, coin-op items, and a lot of other things in between. My son, Mark, is also uh, very much into uh, the same thing and has done uh, kind of taken it to the next level. I hold a bachelor's degree in business administration from Carroll University in Waukesha and a master's degree in post-secondary ed at uh, from University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Um, we also did a radio show uh, for a long time called Sell It Now Radio, and uh, that was fun, uh, premiering topics of antiques and collectibles, and a lifetime collector of a lot of pop culture, including a lot of the things I mentioned before. Um, I've also worked with uh, both Kathy and Sherry in the past, and uh, also the MPTV uh, Antique Appraisal Fair. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sherry, Kathy, and Mike, for sharing a little bit of your backgrounds. Before we move forward, I would also like to share that the format for today's event is a casual presentation. We encourage you in the audience to ask questions by using the chat box. We will do our best to answer all your questions, and we look forward to your participation. At the end of the presentation, we will share the presenter's contact information. In addition, after the event, we will send an email with resources and information from this presentation. A quick update on the appraisal fair from Milwaukee PBS. This month marks a year since we began this pandemic journey. It's been a challenging long year for many, keeping the health and safety of our community in mind and following the city and CDC guidelines we had to postpone our annual Milwaukee PBS appraisal fair last October. As we transition to our new normal, we look forward to continue exploring options for our community events. We are implementing and trying new ways of connecting with you, such as this virtual event. So please check our website for upcoming events, information, and updates. Now, let's start the conversation today with this first question for you, Sherry. How do you know what is valuable and how do you assess value of an item or an artifact? Well, thanks, Andrea. Um, and I think I'm speaking for both Kathy and, um, and Mike. Um, we as appraisers and experts have the difficult task of helping people determine a value. Um, and oftentimes it's a challenge because everybody, including us, thinks our items are, are very, are, are worth a lot. Um, and we oftentimes have the burden of bringing people back down to earth and, you know, actually explaining that, well, yes, it's a wonderful item, but it might not hold as much value as we all hope. Um, and for tonight's purposes, we're going to be doing some um, basics of identifying and assigning values to antiques and collectibles. And the one term um, that I really want everybody to kind of focus on is fair market value. Um, this is a standard term that's used across many different professions, um, but basically in its most simplistic um, format, um, a fair market value means that we have a willing seller and we have a willing buyer. And Carol, if you could maybe go to the next slide, it actually shows what I'm saying. Um, it actually shows what I'm saying. But to give you an example, let's say you inherit um, your grandmother's lamp. Um, and you, most of us do use online to get an idea of, um, of values. So we, we type it into our computer and we find what we think is grandma's lamp. And there it is on either eBay or Cherish or First Dibs or any one of the other sites that are out there. And there's this lamp and it's, it's priced at $1,000. So we all, we all get excited. Um, so part of the fair mar market value definition, there's the willing seller. But now we have to find the willing buyer. And the way we as appraisers find that willing buyer is we look a little bit further under completed items and then we actually find the reality on what the actual items are selling for. Sometimes it's that nice high price, but the majority of times it's a much lower, more realistic price. Um, but really fair market value, um, sometimes you'll also hear replacement value. And that's also um, another term for that is insurance values. 
So we as appraisers are also sometimes asked to come in and talk about, well, let's say you're shipping your furniture across the country in a panel van and you wanna make sure that if it, something happens to your item being transported, that you're able to get a similar item back. So the reason why that uh, price is usually higher is because let's say your piece of furniture gets broken, we now have the, the market to actually try to find a match. So it's, it's no longer that fair market. We can actually um, you know, look at just trying to find a match. But now, so once we have a range of pricing, there's also lots of other things that we look at when we're trying to appraise an item. And some of these things are reflected on the screen. We look at an item's age, we look at a typical style, its size, where it came from or its provenance, how it was manufactured, how it was made, um, if it actually has the designer's name on it, if it still has the label. Um, we also look at how desirable it is in the market um, or it's the demand and then also how rare the piece might be. And then the last probably most important piece of all this is condition. So when people do research, they may find the identical item, but then I come out and, oh, gee, did you realize this vase has a chip on it? Or did you realize that the lampshade's shade is not the original and it's actually been married to, to a different base? Um, so there's lots of different factors. And that's why sometimes um, we'll have people, we encourage people to contact an appraiser for that for that extra little bit of advice, um, because we do try to teach people um, to use the internet, to use tools, um, because that's why it's there. Um, but sometimes you just need a little bit more of an educated eye to actually interpret some of the things you're finding out. Um, the last point that I wanted to just mention too, oftentimes we'll see people and they'll say, well, it's old. Well, unfortunately, age does not necessarily equate with value. Um, and what we're finding in today's market, and I'm gonna actually ask Mike to, to, to come right on board and actually talk about um, real briefly how some current collectibles maybe even have some more value than something that maybe is a hundred years old. So Mike, can you maybe just give, um, you know, just explain a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, we, uh, over the years have gotten a lot of people that have either called the store or talked to me at an event and asked about a particular item and they will, uh, proceed to tell you that, you know, it's over a hundred years old. And, and, um, my answer then is the same as now that age, as you said, doesn't necessarily mean value. And also if the item is new, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have value. And what's interesting is uh, my colleague uh, and I, um, maybe five years ago, had a large collection of Transformer toys that came in. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you look at those and you think, well, they're, they're newer in the realm of things, toys. And when you look at the fact that uh, some Transformers and some, uh, some of the uh, larger ones we had, you know, were thousands of dollars. And far more than they ever sold for new. And uh, there's a lot of examples of toys that are uh, 60s, 70s, um, 80s. I think of like the Kenner Blythe doll, which is a, a doll that has very large eyes, uh, kind, of, um, kind of a very unique look. And it was, I think it came out in the late 60s, early 70s. Those dolls can sell for, again, thousands of dollars for a doll. The typical doll does not sell for thousands of dollars anymore, especially the 100-year-old bisque dolls. Uh, so when you look at things, things have changed. And the uh, one last thing, I guess, to maybe note that uh, people buy what they remember many times. And when you look at uh, folks that are in their 40s, their memory when they were a kid is very different than, say, people that are in their 60s or 70s. And so it's the, the uh, sort of evolving uh, collectible market where you see a lot of folks, even in their, say, 20s or 30s, that are looking at things, you know, oh, I remember that when I was a kid. Well, that wasn't that long ago. So things could be five or 10 years old and still be collectible. 
a very good point, Mike. And it and um, the little statement on the screen right now, and I'm actually going to read it because I, I saw it a couple months ago and it really kind of made me smile. Um, one of the things that attracts me to vintage and antique things is that they have stories. And even if I don't know the stories, I can make them up. <laughs> I like um, that. I, I think this is such a valuable point that I want to bring up. Um, we've seen shows like uh, American Pickers and the Antiques Roadshow, and these are wonderfully entertaining and fun shows. But what it's kind of set us up for is kind of the feeling that everything has value. <laughs> and what is kind of disappointing in that is the stories and the history kind of get lost in the shuffle. And I really would like people tonight to take home with them or, you know, take along with them that, um, yes, value is important, but so is the story. And especially if it's an item that has been passed down your family for many, many years, um, what we're finding a lot of times is young folks today don't really care about the old stuff. And unless we keep sort of pumping up the old items and their value, um, not only are we not gonna be in business, antique malls might not be in business, and maybe just even old stuff isn't gonna really be cared about anymore. Mm -hmm. um, what is kind of encouraging, and Mike kind of alluded to this, is some of the newer collectibles, there is this sort of frenzy and we are seeing more and more younger people get involved totally differently than what the traditional antique dealer was, but that's kind of exciting. And so the rest of tonight's um, uh, show or, or, or talk is going to be on talking about some current items that have value and then also um, sharing a few of the items that some of you have submitted. Um, but I know Andrea also mentioned about using the Q&A. If going forward, anything comes up as a question, um, please don't hesitate typing it in. And towards the end of the presentation, we will try to get to as many of those um, questions as we possibly can. And then the one other thing I wanted to quickly mention, we only have, we are only showcasing a few items. And I know a lot of people did submit items after we kind of closed um, accepting them. Um, this is the first time we've done a virtual show and we really didn't know how popular it was going to be. But um, what I did want to say is um, either myself or Mike or Kathy, our contact information will be available later on. And don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions about your item, um, even after the show is over. All right, so I think we're now going to proceed to talking about our top five. Um, each one of us are going to talk about our type five. So how about Mike? How about if you take it over first? Okay. So what's interesting is, you know, it was hard to kind of, I guess, um, limit it to five, uh, but uh, I successfully did that. Um, number one would be if you take a look at classic cars, uh, trucks, motorcycles, I guess you'd say things with a motor. And I think that's always been something that's enthused me. And uh, our, I think my claim to fame when you look at selling items is getting those items overseas. And the overseas market is very different than the U.S. market, especially Northern Europe. And that's usually on classic cars where they go. That white Porsche ended up in the United Kingdom. Uh, we just shipped a Jeep to Germany and uh, they love our collectibles. I also love our collectibles and our classic, our classic muscle cars, Mustang fastbacks, um, you know, different uh, earlier Corvettes, uh, things like that, but also motorcycles. And when you look at the uh, picture of the Yamaha Enduro, I had one of those as a 15 year old. And to this day, you know, I've had a few of them that we've sold and to this day, I think they're a pretty cool thing. The other thing is uh, guitars and amps, uh, American vintage guitars and amps. I taught guitar for 15 years while I was in grade school, high school, and college. And I love the better vintage instruments. And they have a huge value. Uh, you know, a 50s Gibson Les Paul is twenty to $25,000 and up. Uh, so, 
you know, they, they, they bring, uh, very large dollars. And again, the, uh, overseas market, including Japan, um, on the vintage instruments are pretty hot. The other one to mention is, um, stereo gear, vintage stereo gear, maybe back in the day, walking around Mayfair mall and going to Flanner and half Sue's, which is uh, no longer, uh, but they used to sell a lot of very high-end audio. As a kid, I would walk around there and kind of, you know, drool over the very expensive audio gear that, uh, you know, uh, later in life, of course, I'm uh, I'm living that now with uh, uh, a collection plus also items to sell. And then, of course, the antique jukeboxes, uh, slot machines, and other things like that, which are very hot in Northern Europe. I guess to kind of recap, when you look at what's out there, most of the market aside from the stereo gear is northern europe stereo gear is japan taiwan south korea hong kong singapore and china uh again they love our collectibles i think some of it is just sort of a a love affair with uh you know the the usa back when a lot of that stuff was built in the us and and built very well so and uh i think i've been dealing in this stuff for 30 plus years and uh I think I like it just as much now as I did back in the day. So, so, so Mike, can I um, ask you to share? So I think Mike mentioned it earlier, but we've been together on the MPBS appraisal fair every year. And uh, there was, I think it was last year, well, actually 2019, you had a very unique item come across your table. Um, and would you mind sharing the story? I think we have a picture of it. Um, would you mind sharing the story of that item? This was a great item. And what was funny is uh, you never really know. We've been doing the antique appraisal fair for 50, at least 13 years, maybe 15 years. And every year, a few items come in that are just, you shake your head and you think to yourself, boy, that's an amazing item. And this was, like you said, last year, um, a couple, a family, two family members brought in a Paul Newman race-worn jumpsuit from uh, Road America. And uh, when I saw that, I thought, boy, that can't be real. And then when you, when I looked at it, it's like, yep, that's legit. That's a pretty amazing piece. And so what I did was I got the cameras over and, uh, you know, didn't really say much about it until the cameras were rolling. And then I asked him, I says, tell me a little bit about the piece, right? The story behind it, if you will. And, uh, it really neat story. The family members, uh, used to work, uh, at road America, I guess the, the mom and dad who are now in assisted living, I think, and they were cleaning out the house and found this. And so I said, well, do you have any idea of value? What do you, what do you think this might be worth? And I had said, well, if it's authenticated, it could be worth between eighteen and $25,000. And uh, the face is just, I was really excited to see the look on their face when I gave them that number. Now, the one thing, I guess the caveat is that we're still working on the authentication because it's very hard to do. And when you look at an unauthenticated piece, it's probably worth a third of that, which is still a lot of money. When you think of what are the other venues to sell that? Well, they could have cleaned out the house and had a garage sale, which would have been horrible, um, and probably given it away for a few hundred dollars. Um, but um, I think at auction is the way to go, whether it's me or anybody else, being able to uh, um, really retail an item like that and get top dollar. And uh, so that was fun. Um, real brief, the other, the other one about eight years ago, was um, Bob Barry from WOKY, his secretary, uh, back in the day, babysat the Beatles back in the early 60s. And uh, she, uh, I guess her kids, I think, brought in a, a coloring book that the Beatles filled with tons of uh, letters, notes, lyrics, signatures, everything you can imagine from 1963 priceless piece, probably a quarter of a million dollars at auction right now, walked right into the MPTV event. So pretty neat stuff.
All right. I think I'm uh, I'm up next, Mike. I love I love your stories, and I um, I'm always in kind of an awe of some of the prices that he gets for some things that he ships all over the world, and it makes me realize that with the advent of the internet, um, just how our selling avenues have really exploded and the opportunities have really grown. Um, for my items, so I'm I think I told you in my uh, introduction. I'm an antique dealer that sells out of several local antique malls. I sell online um, via eBay and also Etsy and I've done flea markets. Um, what I find in Wisconsin is um, we don't command quite the high prices as um, maybe an eBay or you know, even, even the Chicago market um, might attain. Um, but we still do okay here. We do get a lot of dealers that come from other states looking to buy from us here in Wisconsin. Um, but my uh, sales receipts at the end of, a, at end of the month, it's amazing how many lower price point items I do sell. Um, so even if I'm not making you know, $500, $1,000 on an item, I'm selling hundreds of $10, $5, $20. Um, and that's what a lot of us as you know, regular collectors, um, we don't necessarily have the hundreds or thousands of dollars of value, but there's still money to be had in um, just the typical antique market. Um, my top five, the, the top one that I think Mike covered a little bit too is that pop culture category. And I just wanted to, getting ready for tonight, I actually pulled up a definition of pop culture. And it's another point that sort of needs to be mentioned, but modern popular culture is transmitted via the mass media and aimed at particularly younger people. And this can include fashion, music, um, some of the toys. And all I wanna do is just mention Beanie Babies. Um, Back in the day, that was considered pop culture. And we all know what that market has sort of turned into. So the one caution that I want to kind of say about pop culture, it's a very fickle. And what uh, may be the case for one month may change you know, a month from now or a year from now. Um, but if you look at the pictures that I have shown here, um, even like the amazing Spider-Man comic that's up in the, up in the corner. Um, a friend of mine is a toy dealer out in Menominee Falls, and she's been telling me stories of how the toy market, uh, especially with Disney Plus and Marvel Comics, you know, a lot of the uh, action shows that are being shown, that market is just exploding right now. So if you have any of those older collector cards, or older comic books, um, make sure you hang on to those and don't store them in the basement. Keep them in a in a nice area so that they don't get musty. Um, so that's that's one area. Uh, also, I think and Mike touched on this, but we all like to collect what maybe we had in our childhood. So not only toys, but maybe advertising, as he said, the cars. Um, record albums, a lot of the Beatlemania, rock and roll albums. Um, there's a picture of the baseball mitt on my collage. Um, you know, how many of us went to Brewers games and the Braves games? So a lot of people are still collecting the old cards, um, a lot of the old sports memorabilia. Um, then the next category is advertising. I think the American Pickers really brought to the forefront all of the signage that can be worth um, a pretty penny. But even some of the old um, paper ephemera, uh, some of the ads, some of those, um, even some old menus, uh, a lot of those paper materials, they may not be worth like tons of money, but still a lot of people are collecting those things. Um, the next area is jewelry. And I know on Mike's number five, um, I think number five for him was gold and silver. And I think what you're going to find for all three of us, that's one category that I think we all have. And I think because gold and silver prices are quite high right now, that's a really good collectible area. Um, we like to try to not necessarily encourage the melting, um, because sometimes a piece of jewelry will still command a pretty good price. Um, and 
I, I don't like to encourage people melting down grandma or grandpa's old ring if it's still usable or if somebody likes the actual setting. Sometimes you can get a new diamond mounted in the setting. Um, but obviously, if you know that you need the money and there's value in it, of course, um, it's okay to get them, um, you know, recycled for scrap. Um, but also costume jewelry is a pretty hot market right now too. A lot of gals are looking to wear a vintage piece at a wedding. Um, I've actually seen ladies that um, will buy even rhinestone brooches that have missing stones and they're making a, uh, a corsage or even a bouquet out of old, out of old jewelry. Um, so a lot of the young folks are tapping into vintage items in, in all unique and different ways. Um, my fourth category is the mid-century modern. And this doesn't just encompass furniture. Uh, it also just encompasses the era. I think that mid-century modern era is probably one of the most popular right now. And I think a lot of the TV shows that are from the 50s and 60s is kind of what's driving that. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Mad Men. So a lot of the vintage barware is very popular. Um, a lot of the clothing, clothing is popular. Um, so that's in, in addition to some of the, the furniture. And I think the reason for that is a lot of young people are becoming more minimalistic. There's shows with the, uh, the tiny houses. They like that more clean line. Um, so that's why a lot of the china, um, a lot of the older glassware is more of the depressed market right now. Um, it's just the young folks just, they don't wanna deal with, if it can't go in the dishwasher, they don't wanna deal with it. Um, and then the, the fifth category that I like to call being popular right now is functional items. And that's again, a very broad area, but if you can use a collectible um, as a, you know, for a functional purpose. So in other words, that lantern that I have pictured, the lamp that I have pictured, maybe even the poster, if it's a cool looking piece of art that can hang on a wall, you know, even the lantern, a lot of people are electrifying them and they're using them as, as light. Um, we also get a lot of people that come in and I'm sure you all have heard the word repurpose. Um, if they can turn it into something else. So a piece of furniture that maybe is almost ready for the curb because some of the uh, veneer is coming off or, um, you know, maybe it's, it's just, rather than throwing it out, a lot of the young folks are repainting it. And those are the only times that I think that's acceptable to do. If it's really like, I'm gonna throw it out otherwise, um, I think it's acceptable to actually repaint things um, or maybe even things that are broken. It doesn't necessarily mean it needs to go into a dumpster or go into a landfill. Maybe there's parts of it that can be salvaged. You know, even an old lamp, sometimes we'll salvage the brass fittings so that we can partner it with another lamp. Um, but so things like that. Um, so that's just a brief summary. And I, I guess now I'll pass it off to Kathy and you'll probably find Kathy has a whole new set of her top five. Thank you. Yes, I do. So again, um, the business that I own is called Caring Transitions of Waukesha County, and it is our top focus to help people downsize and move into the next stage of their life. So a lot of times I'm dealing with people that are liquidating items um, for a different reason than just to uh, raise money. And my buyers are occasionally different buyers than those that Mike and Sherry deal with. Um, my top five, um, looking back over the past year of our online estate liquidations are very similar, uh, collectibles, trains, trading cards, um, comics, things that are vintage. And especially if they're in good condition, we continue to have significant buying interest in those items in the online arena. Um, also, vintage stereo equipment seems to do great as well, and we have buyers from all over the country that are willing to have us ship those items to them, or they will pick them up locally. Also, we're finding that the sterling um, flatware still continues to hold its value to a certain extent. Um, you, you need to make sure that it is truly sterling flatware 
And in order to actually identify that it is truly sterling and not silver plated, you need to be able to identify uh, through either maker's marks or on the back of that spoon handle or the fork handle, it will say sterling on it. You need to take a look at that before you expect that you will be able to liquidate those items or sell them to somebody for a significant amount. Um, as Sherry talked about with the melt value, we are finding a lot of people across the country are buying sterling flatware. And I think it's probably to be melted, but it's our job to get the maximum revenue for our clients. So whoever is going to pay the most amount for that particular item that we're selling, that is the end buyer. We don't decide whether we're going to sell it to somebody or not based on what their use is going to be of those items. Quite honestly, our job is to liquidate for our clients. We always do our best to get that maximum revenue. And that's where I can call in the other folks in this discussion to make sure that we are truly following the right avenue to liquidate those items and get Sherry's appraisal, get Mike's opinion on the best way to liquidate. Other items that we do continue to see selling well is good quality furniture. Um, if it's timeless style or if it's mid-century modern, we still see a lot of that being sold. It's difficult at this point in time in this day and age for us to be able to sell items that are from the 80s, for example. Certain styles of furniture we just can't sell. Certain colors of upholstered furniture, we just can't sell. But with the resurgence of um, mid-century modern interest in even like those orange chairs, they are hot again. Uh, vintage stereo equipment is always great. You see a, a few examples there. And coins, we do find a lot of coins in people's homes. Um, understand that a lot of our clients that we are working with collected items over the last 40, 50, 60 years. And now we are able to work with them on liquidating all those items that they may be a great coin collection. Let's use pennies, for, for example. Some people think because they've got the uh, wheat pennies, they're worth so much more. No, they're really not worth all that much more than actual face value, but some of the collections are actually quite interesting and quite sought after. So we do work with um, coin buyers. I have a couple of very trusted resources that we work with closely, but coins continue, especially gold and um, silver coins. We do find a good resale market for those. Um, some of the things that we often run into is that our buyers are a younger group. Um, our sellers are usually a little more senior than our buying group. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy between what was valuable and saved by our clients, our selling clients versus what collections are interesting to our younger group. But I do honestly think this past year, with people spending so much more time online buying, they're also learning more about the history of items. And to speak to what Mike and Sherry talked about, as people learn more about that history, they're much more interested in finding those items. Um, I think at some point in time during this discussion, we may circle back and talk about some of the challenges we've all seen during this past year, uh, because that's significant for everybody out there to understand. It has been... Um, it's changed the landscape of what we can liquidate, how and to whom, and for what volume. But I will turn this back over to the group um, to continue with our discussions here. Let's go ahead with our slides. Oops, sorry. Um, anyway, we're getting to the point now where we're gonna be spotlighting a few items that were shared with us. Um, but I just wanted to quickly summarize, um, most of the time when we are called in, most people are looking to sell or downsize their items. Um, and Kathy just alluded it to it right now, um, because of the pandemic, there are some definite challenges. Um, but a few things just to keep in mind, um, 
research is extremely important. And I, by the way, I did, somebody did share a question and I, I think it's about Raphael Tuck paper dolls. Um, I think it's very important when you do your research to look at what things are selling for. Um, obviously I haven't had a chance to do the research on these dolls, but the question came in about, is it better to split up the collection or sell them as a whole? Um, and this is where doing your research really plays in um, because they are older dolls. Um, there might not be that big of a market, but who knows, maybe there's somebody who's actually repurposing those dolls into artwork or collages. Um, so it's truly a matter of seeing what the market is showing us. Um, as an antique dealer in a shop, I can't say that there's been a large amount of people coming into the shop to look for those items. So that's why also going into antique shops is, is another way of doing research. It's great to contact an appraiser. You know, we're always here to help. Um, most of the time, I'm more than happy to, uh, you know, just give some consultation to people. Um, but I also think it's very important to be realistic and understand that not everything is going to be hugely valuable. And I think it's also important to look at how much time you have to sell. Um, oftentimes we're called in to do a, an appraisal on a, an estate. And oftentimes, and I'm sure Kathy, you find this too, that most of the time you'll only have two weeks to go into a, a home and you know, liquidate everything. And if that's the case, sometimes, you know, beggars can't be choosers. We have to try to get top dollar as fast as we can. Um, so we don't have the option of trying to squeeze out every last penny that we possibly can. So I think it's really important for people that have estates, you know, really find out what's important to you. Is it to maximize dollar value or do you really just want to be done with these things and move on with the next chapter? Um, so there's lots of options for doing this. There's auctions, there's the online avenues, there's the Facebook marketplace, there's estate sales, um, there's actually selling to dealers, there's donations. Um, there's also consigning your items to a consignment shop. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a resource list with some uh, actual names of places that we've all dealt with and really do, um, we do trust. Um, and then the, just the last factor is we have to keep in mind any fees associated with selling. Um, you know, even with eBay, there's 20% that goes there. A lot of consignment shops have 40%. Estate sales usually have 40%. Um, you know, if you sell to a dealer, they typically offer about a third. Um, so there's just some of those realities that everybody has to keep in mind when they're, when they're selling their items. Um, I'm just going to take a quick peek, make sure there's not a question that I... Um, Okay, so I think, I think we're ready to move on to the next portion, which I do believe is we're going to be showing a, free, a few of our showcased items. Um, so the first item that we were, that this was actually the first item that came in. So they get actually the first, the first item that I'm gonna talk about. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give a real, real brief history and just talk a little bit about the, about the lamp. Um, and then maybe if Mike and Kathy want to chime in and maybe explain that if this item came across, uh, you know, and they're selling venues, how they might handle it. Um, but basically this lamp came in and my understanding, it, it was passed down through generations. It was a grandfather. Um, it's called a reverse painted lamp. Um, the history of these is, Reverse painting actually dates way back to ancient times. Um, back in the 14th to 17th century, uh, the skills of reverse painting on glass were perfected. And then towards the late 1800s, uh, there was a lamp designer that started to incorporate reverse painting on glass in their lampshades, and that would be Philip Handel. Um, he's one of the premier designers, um, and he was trying to 
create a lamp that was beautiful, but not quite as pricey as the Tiffany um, art glass lamps that were on the market back in that time. Um, and today, uh, there are lots of different manufacturers that we find with reverse painted lamps. Um, I did a little bit of research on this one and I actually contacted the, um, the person who submitted the photo and they were unable to find any signatures. Um, so I can only go by the style, the quality of painting, um, you know, the, the fact that I haven't actually handled it. It's, it's hard to say. I'm assuming that the shade is original to the base, but that's something else that if I actually had it in my, you know, in my fingers, I would be looking for that. Um, if you have a lamp like this at home, you might find a signature on the base of the lamp. There, um, some of the bigger manufacturers actually signed, the artist signed the shade and it actually spells out like Handel or Pearpoint. Um, and sometimes a model number is reflected right on the shade. Um, and then sometimes even on the top where the finial attaches, sometimes that also carries a signature. But um, as we'll find with this lamp, um, because we can't attribute it to a particular designer, um, it's still a very, very beautiful lamp. But my, what my gut is telling me by the quality of the, the, the scene, um, it's probably just a regular um, lamp that was recreated after the style of Handel or Pearpoint or Pittsburgh or Phoenix. Those are some of the bigger names. Um, and I would assign the value in today's current market somewhere between $175 and $300. Um, so Mike or Kathy, anything you'd like to add if you saw one of these come across um, in your selling venues? Well, I think the one thing to add also is that uh, one of the first things I would do is lift it to see if it's bronze or if it's sculpted. A lot of times, uh, you know, the heavier it is, if it's a very heavy lamp, more than likely if it's not weighted, it's a bronze lamp. And the other thing I would caution people is uh, many times when you're looking for a signature is when the lampshade gets broken. So be very careful to take the shade off when you're doing that, set it aside somewhere safe and uh, take a good look at it. Um, you know, a lot of times too, we've had some success going through uh, different photos in Google and finding the same lamp, which is crazy when you think about it because there's thousands and thousands of them. But uh, sometimes that can happen. Um, and again, the market, I'll, I guess I'll throw one other number out there. And that is, I think, Sherry, your number is spot on except for if you have somebody that just says, hey, you know what, I really don't care what I have to pay, I just really want it. And there are times that happens where people spend, you know, um, one and a half to two times value just because, you know, it's really what they want. And uh, you know, we've seen more of that, especially over, the, uh, over COVID that, uh, right. you know, that uh, people just want the item, they want it shipped to their door and they just really don't care what they pay. But uh, as Sherry said, beautiful lamp, um, wonderful piece. Um, I think the big thing is just uh, trying to find um, if there is a manufacturer and who it might be. So. I agree with what you both have said. The challenge in a situation like this is finding the right buyer in the right period of time that the seller has um, identified for themselves. Again, if it's um, someone who has two weeks to liquidate the item, it may be more difficult to find that buyer who is willing to pay that $300 plus. Dollars. It's hard to find just the right person. So time that the item is available does make a real big difference in whether you can actually achieve that, that revenue or not. But I would price it probably about the same at a good estate sale. Right. And Mike, Mike did bring up a good point. And sometimes when you, if you are looking for that other person, that's why almost the auction format um, is sometimes right. a little bit better to achieve some of those um, because all you need are two people in an auction and they bid against each other. Um, and that's why eBay sometimes is a very nice selling avenue. 
Um, it's just, you just have to be very, very careful because it, it doesn't always sell for what we hope for. And, you know, right. that's why some of us can sometimes help you make some of those, um, you know, those decisions going forward. Right. The other thing I guess I would also caution people on, let's say that was a handout and it was a very expensive lamp. Um, many times they don't know that. And the person walking through that buys things may not necessarily tell them that that's a very expensive lamp. And then all of a sudden, well, yeah, that's a pretty lamp. I'll give you $150 for it. And it could be a $3,000 lamp. Right. Or even worse, it could be a Tiffany, right? That's a, uh, a little different style. But uh, you know, again, you really have to do your homework before pulling the trigger on selling, a, especially a very uh, unique item. All right, and if we could move to the next slide. I was, um, a big smile came on my face when I saw, when I saw this one. Um, and I think I sent it off to Mike saying, oh, we got your car in here, Mike. Uh, Obviously this is a smaller um, right. version, but, but still it was, um, I was very excited to see it. Um, this came from a family, again, passed down um, through the ages. Uh, the story that they indicated on their um, sheet that they handed in, is it belonged to their grandfather and their grandfather actually um, was the owner of the Milwaukee Motor School business. And in his business, he trained auto mechanics. And this particular car um, sat on his desk and the grandchildren were not allowed to play with it. Um, so this is where the condition um, comes in because it comes into place. And as you can see from the photos, it does look to be in extremely good condition. Um, they also shared a picture of the underside that actually has a partial label, um, but that partial label was um, enough for me to identify it. Um, it was made by Buddy L, um, which was a premier uh, toy manufacturer, primarily of cars and trains and boats and planes and that, that kind of toy, um, you know, quite, quite a way back. They, they go back quite a ways. Um, and it's funny, before the, before the war, um, they made real heavy steel, steel-bodied um, toys. And then through not only uh, lack of resources, but also just the cost of some of the steel toys through the ages, their toys got smaller and lighter weight. Um, but this particular one, it's, it, I love the name too. It's um, the Fliver, which is sort of the slang for the Model T. Mm -hmm. um, and in this particular um, uh, line of toys, they made the Roadster, they made the Coupe, and they made a truck. Um, and I, it was funny, I brought out my old uh, toy book, and I actually found it in the toy book, the book, this is how we used to find our values before the internet. Um, and back in the 90s, the value of this particular vehicle was much, much higher than the kind of the going, um, the going prices today. Um, so today, I found my comparables, like I explained earlier. So the fair market value um, of, and there actually were quite a few online um, and they were selling anywhere from 375 to $500 um, in today's market. But I did, um, I put a little plus by the 500 um, because exactly what Mike said, um, you know, in an online auction, um, you know, you might be able to push that envelope a little bit um, truly because of the, of the condition that it's in, you might just find somebody that really is attracted to this and wants to, you know, pull that trigger for a little bit higher price. Um, but any, either Kathy or Mike, anything to add on, on this one? One of the reasons why we do enjoy doing our online auctions is that, um, you're able to reach that much larger audience. And with something like this, properly packaged. It is extremely shippable. So anybody can buy it. And you're just hoping that you found those couple people that um, are watching for those trigger keywords online to start a bidding war and just drive that price up for everyone. Mike? It is a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm looking at that. I'm, I have the same smile on my face that uh, both of you have. Um, neat piece, 
And as Sherry mentioned, uh, some people feel it's cyclical, that items, their value goes up, then it goes down, then it goes back up. I have always and still to this day contend that the market is a bell curve. So it become, you know, starts out really doesn't have much value because it might be new. It becomes collectible and it gets very, very hot. And it hits a peak and then it goes back down. And many times I'll say, you know, something is maybe three o'clock on the bell curve. This should be a very good example of that, that back in the 80s and 90s, I remember ads running, Buddy L Toys, Buddy L Toys, everybody was buying them. And now when you look at the market, it's definitely not as hot as it once was. But when you think about it, this selling for, and I put the same number on it, maybe three fifty dollars to $500, that's still a lot of money for a toy, right? Especially an older toy that uh, you know, may not have a lot of interest to younger folks. So neat piece. And one other thing I want to mention, I'm not sure if the family took the pictures of this, but they did a very nice job. Yeah, they did. Background yep. and whatnot. I think uh, it's pretty stellar, the, the job they did on the photos. All right, our second, we have a second toy. Um, and this one also was um, rather interesting, totally different style. Um, this is, you know, the German mohair um, and he's a mechanical little wind up guy. Um, when we see mohair, our, right away we think it's stiff. Um, so right away, and I, I think you can see on the third picture, his ear kind of looked like somebody took a bite out of it. Um, so when I first saw it, I thought, oh, gee, maybe it's a stiff. But then if you look at the first photo, um, you can kind of see on his arm. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a close up of it, but there's a little badge on his arm. Um, and that little badge uh, enabled me to actually uh, find the ma manufacturer of this particular toy. Um, it's not a stiff, it's actually a Bing. Um, and in my research, uh, it's actually called Bing of Nuremberg. And then at some point there was a sharing of names. So I don't know if it was a brother or somebody else, but uh, Wernke was the other, at one point it was called Bing Wernke um, company. Uh, but it just, this particular German company was one of the largest uh, toy manufacturers in Germany back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, they were also primarily train, truck, um, you know, more of the, the, the quote boy toy back in the day. Um, but then they started into teddy bears. Um, and interesting information that I found about this company, um, they had a few lawsuits taken out against them with, uh, from Stif. Um, Number one, they started having a button in the ear. And Steiff said, no, sorry, that we had, we have the market on that one. So you can't, you have to stop using the, the button in the ear. So they switched to putting an arrow in the ear. Uh, and then I think they eventually went to having the, uh, I think like a little tin button on, you know, on the sleeve or somewhere else. I think they may have even put it like the under the arm. Um, the family in their description told me that they don't have the key so they really weren't able to identify whether or not this little guy is in working condition. Um, that would make a, a play on the actual value of it. Um, but overall, he does look in pretty good shape. Um, in doing my research, what I did find, though, is monkeys versus bears, um, or other animals for that matter, um, you really can't come close to values uh, bears versus other animals. Um, German mohair bears still command a pretty good price, but this little guy unfortunately can't compete with the, you know, with the bears. And I was rather surprised with some of the Bing bears. Um, what's interesting about this company, because they were good at producing mechanisms, um, a lot of their animals and bears were um, made after like clockwork mechanisms. So a lot of them were automated. Um, and able to do things like there was a tumbling bear and a somersaulting bear and a dancing bear. Um, 
So a lot of those command a little bit higher price. I even saw some of the Bing Bears selling for eight, nine hundred, even a thousand dollars. Unfortunately, this little guy, he's more in the range of maybe mm, 150 to 200 uh, in his current condition. Um, you know, again, if maybe he was working maybe a little bit more, but that's where I think his, his value sits, sits today. Um, any, any input otherwise? I think I'd like to add one thing to that, or maybe a couple small things. One of them is that um, if you have a wind-up clock, many times the key for a wind-up clock will also work. One thing I'd caution people on is many times to try to wind it, they'll take a needle nose pliers and try to turn the mechanism. And that will damage the, um, it'll, it'll damage it or potentially could. So using a clock key, maybe one option, um, but a very neat piece. Um, and again, uh, sort of, you know, past the prime, but still collectible. Kathy, anything, anything to add on? Because otherwise, uh, the one little story that I want to add, um, and this goes back to my childhood. Um, so my aunt uh, had a uh, war era, it was called the Jumpin' Jeep. And it was a, a tin wind-up uh, military kind of Jeep toy. And it had these four little guys sitting into it. And I remember I got the biggest kick out of going over to her house because she actually let us play with it. Um, and the one thing with mechanical toys, they do benefit from being used. Um, and I'm not saying give a three-year-old free reign to, you know, using some of these older toys, but this is where I was talking before about um, educating children on the past. Um, a lot of times toys like this, kids only had one, two, or three toys. That's all they had. And, you know, I think it's sometimes important to share those stories with kids that, you know, today's kids, they may have a hundred toys, <laughs> um, you know, and just that uh, toys become special and you can kind of teach children on how to be careful with certain things and how to appreciate the older toys and just share those stories. You think also it's kind of neat that when you look at something like this, the era of person that would remember this, again, being that it's wind up versus you know, being, you know, my age bracket, um, the Japanese battery operated toys, little, almost the identical uh, box on the back, but it would have batteries inside of it. Right. Yep. right. And, you know, you'd use those to death as well, either outside and something bad would happen on you know, the driveway or in the basement or whatever. And you'd have friends that would be very careful with their toys. They'd all be perfect. And then you'd have other friends where, you know, the toys would last maybe one or two play periods and that would be about the end. So kind of kind of interesting when you look at, uh, you know, the different variations of toys and then wireless today, right? That's, or not today, but within the last 20 years. Right, toys. right. So then our last item we're gonna showcase tonight, um, these are actually two different typewriters. Um, the one is an Underwood, and then the other one, we only could fit in a, a side view of it, but it's actually a much smaller Corona folding typewriter. So the family that submitted this one um, explained that grandpa wanted the desktop. <laughs> I, I use the term desktop rather loosely, but if you think about our computers of today, can you imagine this sitting on your desktop and having to type a letter to somebody? Um, but it the larger one, the Underwood, is actually a Model 5. It, uh, the family did send or included the serial number, and this particular model dates back to 1921. Mm -hmm. um, the history of this particular model, it was, it was kind of the standard, and it was popular for three decades. Um, it was the top of the top seller for Underwood for, you know, for 30 years. Um, starting, I think, late 1800s and then going through the going through the 30s. Um, again, just from the photos, it looks like this particular one is in wonderful condition. Um, I want people to take particular note of the keys. Um, the way the keys were manufactured, uh, there's paper where the key 
you know, the, the letters of the keys or letter of the alphabet is put on the key, but then it was covered with glass. Um, so to see that and to see that that survived, you know, a lot of times we'll see these typewriters with the decals worn, some of the lettering worn out. Um, so this, I think, is a very, very nice example. Um, you know, you can still get ribbons for them uh, online, so they actually can still be used. Um, the other one, the Corona model, um, the family does not have the case that it came in any longer. Um, the, this one actually folds to fit inside of a, it's like a reinforced cardboard case. Um, and obviously if, if it still had the case, its value would go up a little bit, but um, I think they were used in a military capacity that um, the reporters would actually carry along their typewriter and they would actually type up things. So they obviously needed a smaller one. Um, you know, and this grandmother needed a smaller one so that she could move it around the house. Um, so values on these, um, I think the, the Model 5 was pretty prevalent online and they ranged anywhere from $5 all the way up to 300. This particular one, because of its nice condition, you know, even if I had it in the antique mall, I could see it being priced 150, 175, maybe even 200. Um, the other one, probably a lot less because it doesn't have the, um, because it doesn't have the case, we're probably more in that 50 to $100 range. Um, one little piece of trivia that I did find, um, the first successful typewriter was developed in actually 1874 um, by Remington. That's another quite a well-known manufacturer. Um, and when he designed that, or when it was designed, they actually designed it with the QWERTY keyboard, which is really still in effect today. So that's just a little piece of trivia that something that we, you know, was developed how many years ago, um, some of the technology, you know, with that QWERTY keyboard is still being used today. Um, the one thing about the value I did want to mention too, if you have a typewriter like this, but let's say it's been stored in the garage and the mice have been burrowing in the keyboard and et cetera, et cetera. They do clean up pretty well, but if your model just looks like it's ready to be said goodbye to, um, there is value in the parts. Um, uh, I've found people even on Etsy using recycling the keys, cutting them off, polishing the backs and making jewelry out of them. Um, so even if you think it's pitchable, um, you might want to think about maybe, maybe what else could it be used for? So either Kathy or Mike, anything else you want to add on, you know, this, so this kind of falls in almost the industrial category too. So if anybody wants to add anything about industrial type items, um, I'll, I'll let you guys take the floor from here. I'll just jump in for a minute here, Mike, you can talk more about the industrial, the current value. It's not unusual for us to find a typewriter in a home. It's uh, a lot more fun to find these older typewriters because there is still interest in those. Usually we don't find them in half as good a condition as what we are looking at here. Uh, we recently did run across a folding typewriter. So I smiled when I saw this one. Um, but again, there was no case with it, but it was in pretty good condition with the exception of a lot of the keys were not in the best um, situation, but we do enjoy finding these, uh, the ones like on the left, the Underwood, and we do have clients that still occasionally play with them just because they can. Um, but as, as far as resale, retail, Sherry, I agree with you. Um, even in the best of, of conditions here, I think the most we've gotten for like the, the Underwood type um, desktop, should we call it, in our online auctions is usually a little bit over $100 if they're in, in good condition. And I was just going to say that when you look at like the um, some of the industrial whether it's a typewriter or some of the, like the trolleys used for coffee tables. It's funny, that seems like that's the last maybe 10 to 15 years, that's become something that's fairly big. And people will take something that uh, 
you know, is an industrial piece of uh, machinery, even like a large gear. And they will put it, you know, as a conversation piece in their house as a, you know, as a top of a coffee table or whatever it might be. Um, a lot of things like the, I guess this is sort of falls along the same uh, lines that people will take a uh, industrial table and they'll put a, a piece like this typewriter on top of it as a, almost like a prop, you know, for a room. And uh, so we're, we're seeing a lot more of that as well. Um, especially if you walk around places like Elkhorn and whatnot, the flea market, and you look at, uh, you know, what people are selling, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of pretty nice uh, typewriters and whatnot that are out there on tables. And I would put the same number on it that uh, everybody listed. Okay, so I think we're getting close to wrapping up the formal part of our presentation. So if while we're going through our resource list, if you might have a question or two and you wanted to type them into our Q&A, um, we'll be happy to look at those. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention is, and I'm sure Andrea will talk about this at the end too, but you will be getting surveys. Um, the three of us put this presentation together. This was our first attempt to doing it. Hopefully it has been beneficial. Um, again, I think we're flexible to um, tweaking our format a little bit, um, doing more online appraisals. Uh, again, I think and Andrea alluded to this in the beginning. We don't know when we'll be meeting in person, hopefully sooner than later. Um, we are tossing around some ideas of doing our appraisal fair on a smaller scale, but if this is beneficial, um, we've even been um, maybe talking about bringing on some different specialty area appraisers. So whether it's a coin person or uh, you know a toy a toy person, bringing some other appraisers on too. Um, so if you have something specific you'd like to see, please don't hesitate to put it um, in the comment section of the survey that you will receive. Um, just looking at the resource list, I mentioned about some consignment um, shops. A lot of times we'll get people with really nice furniture. Furniture right now is a very tough sell. Um, a lot of antique dealers are even shying away from it because it takes up a lot of space in their booths. And sometimes they have to sit on a piece for a, a long period of time. That's why sometimes a consignment shop might be a good choice. And I think on our list, we have two, the design exchange and then also um, the Ottoman Society. Um, the coins are also something we get asked about a lot, and it sort of overlaps into gold and silver. Yeah. A lot of coin dealers also do buy um, sterling and gold. But again, I, I really like to encourage people, um, you know, just like when you go to your doctor, get a second opinion. Uh, you bring your coins into a coin place. You don't have to sell them to that coin dealer right there. They're very nice about letting you, um, you know, say, let me think about it. Um, I truly encourage people to do that. Um, and I think that was about the extent of our, our resources. Um, the ones that we suggest we've all dealt with at some level, um, you know, here and there. Um, and when we do work with our clients too, if we have another avenue, we're, we're more than happy to share um, you know, to share resources with people as well. Um, you will be getting our contact information in your follow-up email. Um, but now I guess I'd like to open it up to some questions. I think we had one that came in that had something to do with um, some uh, paper, paper ephemera. Um, and I think somebody had uh, submitted a photo late of a, um, I think it was a Western poster and it, they, I think they asked about, you know, some kind of like the value on that paper materials. And I think Mike alluded to it when he said that they found the Beatles album um, with all the, like the scrapbook with the signatures and that Coloring. Um, yes. paper is something that you mm -hmm. need to spend a little bit of time um, going through items. Um, it is, you never know what's hidden in paper. And even with books, sometimes people hide money or hid other like autographs, 
they sometimes hid it, you know, back in the day, books were used as a safe place to keep things. Gold coins um, as well. Right, and right. So it's pretty amazing. So I truly recommend going through, you know, different paper materials and just if, if in doubt, make a pile and, and have one of us have somebody take a look, you know, before you make that final, you know, that final pitch. Um, and then we had a question come in, and I think I'm going to direct this to you, Mike. Um, they, asked, they asked, when researching completed sales on eBay, I often see best offer accepted. Am I correct that the actual sale price is then not shown? That is correct. So when you look at, you know, we always tell people, go into completed items to look at what the item actually sold for or sold items. And what you'll see is best offer accepted. There's no way to tell how low that best offer was. You can make an assumption that it was maybe 10 or 20% under what the asking price, but that's an assumption. There are times where, you know, there, there are people that will lowball people that have items out there and throw an offer of half of what they're asking. And some people may have had it out there a while and think, well, what the heck, it's more, at least I'm getting something out of it and they will accept it. But I think the generally accepted rule is it's probably 10 or 20% under what the asking price was. I hope that helps. I think you summed that up really well because I, I see that an awful lot too. And I, I do sell on eBay and when people make offers, I try not to, to you know, get, take their lowball offers. Um, but if it's an item that I've had in my shop for you know, six months, I might be more willing to you know, to take that lower price just to move it, you know, to move it on. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the one other thing that I would kind of, we sort of were asked a question, you know, um, how do we make a determination? And Kathy, I think I'm going to direct this one towards you. Um, if we're, you know, somebody is liquidating an entire estate, you know, how do you make a decision on um, how to actually go about doing that? Um, so maybe Kathy, if you want to field that one a little bit. If you're talking about how do we determine the format of the liquidation, physical estate sale, you know, in-person estate sale or an online auction, there are a number of different factors that we need to consider. First off, what is the situation with the access to the items? Um, are they going to remain in our client's home? If so, and our client is still living there, it is our, up to us to determine with our client whether or not they are comfortable having people in their home or not. And this past year has further reduced the number of people that are willing to have in-home sales because of uh, social distancing, uh, their concern with people bringing potential virus into their home. More often than not during this past year, we have found that there are almost no physical estate sales going on and we chose not to do any during the past year as well. We have found that the online auction approach is much better. We have found that our clients are receiving as much revenue as they would in a physical estate sale and it costs our clients less for us to do an online auction than a physical estate sale. And they are less inconvenienced. So access to the items, um, interest in those types of items makes a real big difference too. And parking, believe it or not, and time of year makes a huge difference. So all things considered, an online auction in most circumstances is as effective or more effective in maximizing revenue for our clients than a physical in-person estate sale. So I hope that's what you were asking about. Mike, what are your thoughts on that? I would say exactly the same thing. When you look at um, the local market of um, people within the city, typically at a sale that you might have in person versus even if you're not necessarily, you know, shipping items maybe overseas, but you still have the national market. And with, uh, with them being online, if, uh, you know, I can remember back to a sale that uh, Kathy had that she had some clips, clips horns 
that uh, speakers, floor speakers that were incredible speakers. And they actually went more for more than we would have sold them for overseas in a uh, setting that was a uh, in-person with an online component, I think at the time. And uh, I mean, they just did extremely well. So I think that online with the, with the various search words and whatnot, um, I think that's really the key. And I, Kathy, you also, something just popped in my head um, that maybe you can help um, share with the group too. Um, how have you found um, your ability to donate items? Oh, thank you for bringing that up, Sherry. So that has really affected um, how we approach sales a lot of times as well. If you think about this past year, most donation companies closed their doors for several, several months. So your typical St. Vincent de Paul, Goodwill, other places like that had their doors closed. So any items that we could not sell, we had challenges finding the next right home for those items. Even now, companies are accepting fewer items for donations because they cannot let as many people into their stores as they used to. So they are turning over less merchandise. Therefore, they're accepting less merchandise. They are also getting much more selective in what they are accepting. So there's been a huge downturn in the number of true donations that we can give to various causes that people want us to provide those um, items to particular organizations. And even those companies that typically have taken donations of medical, medical equipment, that has been severely restricted again this year. So we try to find the next right answer for our clients. We don't want anything going in the landfill that we can avoid um, having that be the final resolution, but donation capabilities are way down. So that's a challenge for anybody who is trying to clear out their home or at least downsize and declutter. So it's check around before you take any donations any place. You may be very disappointed when you show up there. So, and I, there was one, thank you, Kathy, for that. Um, there was one other question and I'll read it verbatim from the chat. And it says, I have a collection of early advertising paper dolls, some late 1800s and some Raphael tuck paper dolls. Is it better to sell as a collection or as individual pieces on eBay or where? Um, I'll start, but I would love everybody else's input too. Um, it's kind of a difficult question without being able to see, um, you know, what you mean by a collection. Um, if they came in the book and, you know, some of the paper dolls were actually punched out of the book, um, it's nice to keep them all together. But if it's several years worth of a collection, you might be able to split it up. Um, if somebody came to my office with that collection, I would almost immediately go on the internet and just kind of get a feel for how they're selling. Again, I would look in the completed category. Um, what is kind of a bit of a red flag when, when you say late 1800s, that means they are very old. And this is what we talked about earlier. Age does not necessarily equate with a high value. Um, the people that maybe collected those as children or had them as children are they don't have as much interest right. in them anymore. So there may be a much smaller audience that's looking for them. Um, I think I might've mentioned a lot of that paper ephemera, um, even in the antique shop, we don't get a lot of people that are coming in. There are some, um, but not a lot. So that's why I almost think that maybe a platform like eBay would be maybe the best place to do it. Um, you know, and, and I've seen collections being sold on eBay, but you just have to use as many photographs as you possibly can, have a wonderful description, and then maybe just have realistic expectations that it might not sell for lots of money, but at least you know it's going to go, you know, it's going to go to a good home. Um, I think the other thing I'd like to add to that is when you look at collections of items, now these are smaller items and, uh, Raphael Tuck also did the postcards and a bunch of other types of paper memorabilia. Um, they're small, so a collection would not take up a lot of uh, uh, room to ship, let's say. 
And when you look at shipping, shipping is based on dimensional weight. So sometimes people say, well, I have this toy collection and I want to sell it as a collection. The problem is you might have 12 boxes of toys. And when you start to ship those, it starts to get very expensive. One other thought is it's very hard to get certain search words for certain toys or certain dolls or whatever it might be when you have a lot of them. And uh, we've always, our general rule of thumb is when you part a collection out, you will always max it. Most of the time you will maximize the value versus selling it as a collection. Uh, more pieces tend to um, equate to more money than you know one piece sold as a single item, even though it's a collection. That's been our, I guess, our uh, philosophy over the years. So, although there are times where it makes sense to sell something as a uh, collection. And Sherry, I have one question here. Would an old coffee ad be worth anything? It is on cardboard and in black and yellow advertising coffee. I believe it was for something like 57 cents a pound. Um, so that, that's a good question. And there's a term called cross categories. Um, and what it means is, so somebody who collects um, advertising um, might be interested in the item. Somebody who collects coffee cans might be interested in the item. And then the third category area would be somebody that maybe is looking to take the coffee ad. So in other words, if the ad is in nice shape and it's colorful, it sounds like it might be, um, it might be something that someone could frame and then let's say put up in their kitchen or you know, even at a, like a coffee shop, I could see uh, it you know, becoming artwork. Um, so there's kind of three, we try to maximize the category areas where we, you know, try to get people interested. So I think your piece may, you know, cross over several different categories. Um, but what I also do want to say is we're probably once again, not looking at a huge value, um, but still it's definitely something that somebody would be interested in. Size and condition is going to be key. Yep. Great. Um, any last thoughts on how you may help a client, Sherry, Kathy, and Mike? One of the first things I'd say is what most people have already heard. Don't just start throwing things away. What, and please get a professional's opinion before you start emptying out that basement or that garage attic or any other area in the home, just because you don't think it has value does not mean a thing. You really have to have experience. Mike, you've got a couple great examples of that. I think the thing that really concerns me is when I pull up to a client's house and they have a dumpster out front. And my thought is what have they thrown away in the dumpster that may have value? I think it's really hard for the average layman or layperson to be able to determine that well, this is an old radio, it doesn't work, so it can't have any value or whatever it might be, right? And you think, boy, you know what? You may have a really good piece. One great story, and I won't mention where it was uh, brought in, but um, they, uh, there was a, there's a very well-known company that is a uh, recycling center for, ster for uh, old electronics. And uh, they called us up and said, I can't, um, I can't believe this came in. And it was a $3,000 Macintosh power amp that uh, family brought in to recycle because it doesn't work and it can't have any value. It's still sold for over $3,000 not working. So you never really know what you might have. Have an expert walk through. Don't sell anything directly until you find out the value um, and don't throw anything away. I think uh, just what Kathy said is uh, is golden as far as advice. And, and for me, I just, I just wanted to add that it's been a very, very enjoyable evening. The only thing that's kind of odd is we don't get to see our audience's faces. Um, so hopefully we have been engaging and hopefully we will uh, be able to see everyone again uh, in person sometime soon. Um, and, but it's been very enjoyable and I truly enjoy working with Mike and Kathy. And, and of course, you've, it's been very well run by Milwaukee PBS as well. So, so thank you, everyone.
And one last question before we uh, leave, are local auction willing to sell items that may not be of high value? That's a really good question. I think we get that every, every day or every week for sure. People asking, well, what is your minimum dollar amount? Um, and I think every company has kind of increased their value. And I think what it is, is when you pay somebody to list an item, there's overhead. And uh, so you, you wanna be careful that you're not um, taking a commission for a $20 item and paying your employee $15 an hour to be able to list that item where you're losing money. We used to joke around, it'd be better off giving somebody uh, say a $20 bill and letting them take their item than necessarily listing it. Uh, there are companies though, and I'm sure both Kathy and Sherry would, would agree, there are companies that may be better selling lower ticket items and that's what their specialty is. So making sure you kind of find out find out their minimum and uh, find out why they do have a minimum and uh, find out what their specialty items are because I think that's another key. And I, I, agree. I just, I, and I also wanted to say too, from the estate sale perspective, um, once you do make a decision to go with a company, make sure you're pretty solid on which things you want the company to sell for you. Because a lot of times the company will come in and they'll get excited about some things and then they'll come back to actually physically do the sale and all the better things are gone. Um, and it does make it hard, um, you know, because obviously everybody needs to make money um, in, in the businesses that we're in. And if all that's left are, you know, 10, five, $10 items, it's kind of hard to recoup some of the costs that are associated with it. So, so right. just be sure that you know exactly what items you, you know, you do want to part with and, um, you know, and, and what you want to keep. Agreed. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> All right. I think that's all for tonight. Thank you, Sherry, Kathy, and Mike for being here with us tonight and for the great information. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your items and your stories. That brings us to the end of an evening with Antiques and Valuables. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. We'd love to hear your thoughts about today's event on our survey. The survey link is available in our chat and will be available in our post-event email as well. And don't forget to check out our Milwaukee PBS website for upcoming events at milwaukeepbs.org slash events and follow us on social media and our Facebook and Instagram pages. On behalf of Milwaukee PBS, thank you for joining us. I'm Andrea Rivera de Vega. Good night.